Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. We've been looking at 2 Corinthians now for a couple months. Last week, we um, transitioned into chapter 8 um, and, uh, and looking at the end of 7, beginning in, then through chapter 8. And I said that I was splitting up because chapter 8 and chapter 9 originally were going to be one message. And I was like, nah, there's no way this is going to happen. So I split it up. And technically, last week, the message was titled, The Priority of Giving. Um, but we talked a lot about how, in that message, about how afflictions really reveal who we are. Do the splash screen. Um, reveal who we are and what we really believe. That as we go through trials, as we go through tribulations, that whatever is in us is going to come out. And Paul begins... Um, talking in this and using the illustration of the Macedonian believers in chapter 8 and talking about how they, in their poverty and how, in their great affliction, how they gave with great liberality. And so, and, and we're going to come back to this concept, but that they did all this because they first gave themselves to the Lord. And so the reality then is that as we embracing afflictions is, is the overall theme that we see this, and Paul continually talks about different theologies and different applications, but it always comes back to how afflictions come into this thing. That, that when I give myself wholeheartedly over to Christ, then it doesn't matter what come, come what may, I'm going to glorify Him. And a few weeks ago, we talked about how then those afflictions can be seen as spiritual as well in the spiritual realm, not just in the physical realm, but in the spiritual realm that there are, and we're going to talk about um, in a few weeks from now, we're going to talk about how the, there's a spiritual war when we get into chapter, um, chapter 10, because we're going to take a little hiatus and we're going to talk about fasting um, as we go into our week of prayer and fasting. Um, but then we're going to look at the warfare of our flesh. Or warf- the war- our warfare is not of the flesh, but is, is spiritual. And then we're going to go on, and we're going to talk about how Satan loves to bring in his counterfeits. And so Paul says, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy in chapter 11, because someone may come in with another Jesus, another spirit, or another gospel, and you may very well accept them. And so there's the spiritual afflictions that go on as well that we struggle with, and so that, that we, we battle one of those great spiritual afflictions, if you would, is giving. Is giving. And so I kind of mentioned that a little bit last week as we went into this. But again, the, 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 the central and core theme of that is, is, first, I've got to give myself. So last week, we, we, we talked about the priority of giving as a title, but really we talked about the how afflictions, what afflictions reveal in us. But again, behind the scenes of that, in that priority of giving us, because the Macedonians, first of all, gave them themselves. Today we want to look at the principles and promises of giving, and I'm going to be looking at chapter 8 as, long, as well as chapter 9, and we're really going to deal with this more topically than we are than verse by verse by verse by verse. So we're going to go through them, in, in a sense, by verse, but the reality is that there are themes, there are principles that I want to bring out as we come through this, Okay. And the first one of the principles is, is exactly what I just got done speaking about, and that is you've got to give personally. And what I mean by that is that th- this has got to be something that's a part of who you are. It, it, there are a lot of philanthropists that are in the world. But a lot of philanthropy in our, in our, in our country ultimately is done in order to save taxes. It, it's not because somebody is fully engaged in a... Um, a purpose, but rather they're just kind of throwing money out. And so, um, I, I'm not saying you got to watch Shark Tank, but um, but a few weeks ago, Andrew and I got the we we're up in uh, Winston Salem, and we watched about an hour and a half, two hours of Shark Tank. And um, and what was really interesting is to watch the. Uh, Sam told me that they are considered angels. Um, there are specific terms for those who donate into businesses, and those. The ones that are on there would only be considered angels. I don't consider them angels. But anyways, but that's what they would be termed in the business realm. But as you looked at them, they all wanted to know 
one thing, now there was multiple things that, that each one of them might want to know, but they were consistent. And one thing that they would want to know about the person who was presenting to them, asking them for money. What was it? No, it wasn't about how much you're going to spend. How much you want to, well, how much you're willing to spend is part of it. No, 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 I know. The person standing up, how much, that's part of it. How much they want to put themselves Not just how much money. What did you say? What they put themselves in. Well, that's all money. See, we're thinking money, money, money. But the money really is indicative of what? How committed to this are you? Now, we see that in the terms of money. See, you guys are getting this. You see it in terms of money. And we play it out there. But how committed you are to something ultimately is going to what? Affect what you give to it. Why do people struggle? And again, I'm not trying to be political. Why do people struggle with taxation? Not committed to the cause? I'm good with taxation. You know, it, Steve knows I struggled for years because the government was paying me and I didn't even put in taxes. I was like, this doesn't make any, I, this is totally contrary to what I believe. Okay? Why? Because we have a nation. As a nation, there are certain commodities and things that we need to do, right? And so we all have to what? Pay in. We all have to give a, a share. Well, it's the same concept, even more so, with the kingdom of God. When it comes to the, the church, there are needs within the assembly that only can be dealt with if there's what? People giving. Now, i got to step back for a moment. I was going to share this way. In, in, in the, in the, it's not on your sermon note sheets, but, but it, look... This is a humongously giving church, okay? So this is like, you know, falling. You know, it's like, man, I'm preaching to the choir. But I don't know. This is, we're, we preach when we come through it, right? Okay? And so if this fits you, this fits you, okay? Um, but the reality then is, it's talking about like your afflictions and how your afflictions reveal who you are. Your giving really reveals who you are. And what is most important in your life? And so, know what it says here that with the, the Macedonian believers. It says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the what? Grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. They first gave themselves to the Lord, then to us by the will of God. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Do you realize that giving, and giving to it hurts, and giving... Personally, when you're all in, is an act of grace. It's an act of grace. I can't do it on my own. I can't do it on my own. My flesh doesn't want any part of that. It's got to be fully by the grace of God. But how much grace did God extend to you when you first got saved? All of it. So in Sunday school, I, I did the quote from Aslan about it's not for us to know what would have been, but we all can know what will be if we just take that step. We're going to see promises at the end of this, okay? And we're going to see things that go on here. But the reality is, until I embrace the grace of God, I never get it. That's why Peter, his very last statement to this church that was scattered abroad, the very last statement that Peter ever makes in print, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's so much more of it that we haven't experienced. We just have to get less of ourselves and more of him. So give personally, give yourself. Secondly, Chapter 8, verse 2 and 3 then. He says, give liberally. Give liberally. It says that in the great trial affliction, an abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Aren't you glad that God gives liberally? That's what we, we, James 1, right? If anybody asks, lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men what? Liberally, Okay. Mark 12, verse 41 to 44, talks about the widow's offering. How much did the widow give? Good, all. Okay. Technically, how much did she give? Two mites. But you gave the right answer. She gave what? She gave it all. And so when Jesus looked at her, he didn't see two pennies. He saw 
full commitment. There had the, 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 the rich people coming through and they were given, 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 given. But Jesus didn't see that. He saw what? A token gift, a token gift, a token gift, a token gift. The widow came through and he said, she's all in. You get it? And so if you are all in, the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to give liberally. Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. We'll talk about that theme in just a little bit. Proverbs 22, verse 9, He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. God wants us to be generous. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Third, we're called to give faithfully. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, drop down to verse 10. In this I give advice, it is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago, but now you also must complete the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. You've got to finish what you started. Drop down to chapter 9. Look at verse 3. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go with you, to go ahead of you, um, go, to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not a grudging obligation. So, principle number three, faithfulness. To do that which you have promised that you would do. Luke 16, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. I don't know how much money you have. I try to stay out of the giving. I have no clue who gives what. Don't want any part of that. And I don't know how much you make. And I certainly know how fast what I make goes. Make sense? I just pay taxes. I got it. You know, and how much more I got to start putting away for quarterly taxes for federal government. Since now I pay for federal taxes, um, I get to start paying my fair share. And, um, and I know how fast that stuff goes away. However, the reality is, whether you've got $100 or where you got $100,000, God still calls you to be faithful in how you use it. This message isn't going to talk about tithing at all. It's not in this passage. But most of you know that I, I believe that that's where it all starts, that God didn't change his standards, that he began it. We're going to see that it's about proportional giving. But the reality is that when he talked to the Israelites, he, he talked to the Israelites about the, the fact that they were robbing from him when they withheld what he expected them to give back. Now, we'll talk about proportionality in just a moment, okay? But the reality is, in faithfulness, okay, if God has burdened you to give something, does it make sense? And you don't give it, then there's a lack of what? Faithfulness. And so completing the task, completing the task, completing the task. We talked about that a little bit last week. So these three, first three points we talked a little bit about last week. Fourth, you need to give willingly. So you continue that in chapter 9, um, or I'm sorry, verse chapter 8, verse 12, when he's talking about there needs to be the readiness to do this. Verse 12, for if there, for if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. There has to be a willingness. So back over in chapter 9, verse 2, Paul says, I know your willingness, which I boast of you to the Macedonians. So in order for you to give personally, in order for you to be able to give liberally, in order for you to be faithful, you have to be what? You need to be willing to do that, okay? You need to be willing to do something. So this may be the rubber meets the road for you. It may be a matter of whose desire is greater, yours or God's. 
What is it your will to do? What is it that you want to do? Do you want to please God in what you have? Now, into the, this, the newer sections that we're talking about, is to give then purposefully as well. So right there in that same passage in chapter 8, verse 12, if there's first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one, what? Has. Not according to what one does not have. Go over to chapter 9, verse 7. So let each one gives as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So back in his first epistle to the, the church of Corinth, in the very end of his, his epistle to them, um, in chapter, oh, chapter 16, he writes to them in verses 1 to 4, and specifically here in verse 2, that on the first day of the week, let each of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So that he was already letting them know, they had already promised to give this gift, and so he, he, he gave them the, the, the way to do that. That on the first day of the week, you take a portion of how God has prospered you, and you what? Lay it aside. Now, they didn't necessarily take that collection at that moment. Paul was going to be going to what? Take up the collection. But it may be that they brought it together and the church held it as one. I don't know. But the idea was that on a weekly basis, as a weekly basis, that they were to analyze how God had blessed them and they were supposed to take a portion of that and set it aside as a gift to him. Now, what was the portion? Well, it doesn't say. See, we think tenth, right? It could have been first fruits. I mean, the principle of first fruits goes even beyond before the principle of tithing. Makes sense? But we're not told. That's where I see. So we're left it here, okay? Because sometimes God burdens us to do what? To give more. That's exactly right. So you have first fruits, you got tithing, and then you had offerings. Okay? There were multiple things in the Old Testament. So First fruits was a was a, a a command that they had to give the first fruits of the crops. But then there was also the tithing, which went to the temple to help pay for the 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 with the temple tax and such to pay for blah, 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 to support the the Levites and the in the priests. But then there were just the general gifts and the offerings, the fellowship offerings that people could just free will offerings that oh, people just wanted to give more. We tend to be people who look to the minimum. Tell me what I need to do. Give me the bottom line. What do I have to do? Many years ago, I heard a great illustration. It was on Focus on the Family. And they were talking to the, and some of you have been long enough, you've heard this before. They were talking to the, um, who was the chief of police of Los Angeles, um, LAPD. And he wasn't the chief at that moment. He was in a assistant, but um, during the days of the riots many, many years ago in the L.A. riots. Um, so again, gives you a perspective how many years ago, okay? And he said that his son had come home from college, and he told him, he says, Dad, I figured out the problem with Christianity. He says, well, fine, help me out, son. We've been trying to struggle with this for many years. He says, well, see, the problem with Christianity is that they're, 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 they're keeping this separation from the world. No, hang on, because you, you, you may be thinking, he says, the problem is the world is on a downward slope. So as we're seeking to maintain our separation from the world, we're on that same downward slope. But God's holiness never changes. So as we're keeping our eyes upon the world, saying, I just got to keep a, a step or two of separation upon the world, what's happening with my relationship with God? It's becoming further and further separated. If you are only worrying about the minimum, then again, go all the way back to the top of the message. You're missing the grace of God. Because what did God give for you? All of it. That's exactly right. And what did he give you? All of it. Do you get it? If I'm only thinking, oh, what's the bottom line? What's the minimum I got to give? 
That's like the people who, who talk about with um, Christian liberty. Everybody's about liberty. I got my liberty. I saw one post on Facebook recently about, and so nothing personal about guys wearing hats. Okay? About it was a, some of them wearing hats and stuff like that, and yet in 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 the church and stuff like that. In the the comments was were just amazing um, as it went back and forth. But the overall thing was, but I got my liberty. But I have my liberty, and everything was about liberty. Wow. Galatians 5 says that you've been given liberty to do what? To serve. To serve one another. It wasn't so you can serve yourself. He says, it's not given to you as an occasion for your flesh, but rather that you can love one another, you can serve one another. That's why you've been given liberty. And so in this Christian liberty thing, we want to know, why can't I? But the better question should be, why should I? Why should I? So when it comes to giving, why can't I give everything? Do I really believe that God is able to outgive me? It really becomes the issue, doesn't it? So give purposely. I don't know what it is. It may be 1%. And I'm thinking percentages here, okay? It may be numbers. God's taken me away from percentages. I, I, t- I asked God, take me away from percentages because I was becoming legalistic for Bob. I just want to know an amount. Tell me what you want to give, want me to give. And, and, and we did. And there was sometimes with the jobs and jobs weren't coming in and there was no money. And Steve can tell you some of these days, I'm just kind of really struggling. And, and God was just challenging me. Are you still going to give it? I'll still give it. And God continually... I have not missed a payment on anything in 15, 17, whatever long this church has been going on. Okay? God has continually made, given me the money to pay everything. It's just an amazing thing. But God put on, I mean, I remember this amount. I was like, there's no way, God. I can't do that. It just doesn't make sense. But he says, that's what I want you to give. And so I did. So I just want to challenge you on that. Okay? I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. Because, again, this is a really, really, really giving church. Okay? But if this applies to you, you just need to understand, again, you need to, to step out there in faith knowing that God is able to do what he's promised to do. Okay. Sixth, finally under the principles of giving, to give cheerfully. This is the big one. Chapter 9, verse 5. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift, your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so you can see... If you can see, I know it's hard from the back, okay? But all these purple words here, generous gift, generous, generosity, bountifully, bountifully, they're all the same word in there. It's the word um, eulogia, eulogia. Um, and it's really kind of neat. This is actually the word for um, like a benediction, like um, a, it's eulogy, it's a eulogy, okay? And so like if you're going to say good words about somebody, okay? It's really what this word, this what this is, okay? But it means then to be generous and, 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 and to give good words, okay? Good, good thoughts. And so all this, this stuff is going on. It's generously and good and good and good. It's all you're thinking, okay? But this word grudgingly then down here is our word lupe, which I don't know if you're remembering this, but back in chapter 1 and chapter 2, we talked about sorrow a lot. And then we brought it back up again later about this sorrow and sorrow. This is our word, sorrow. So not with Sorrow. <laughs> oh, I don't want to give. Oh, I got to write this check. You know? I mean, that's the idea. It's like, are you weeping because you got to part with it? Just think God gave you 90% or more, whatever. Anyways, I'm sorry. I dropped back into the tithing thing. Okay? That, I mean, everything you got is a gift from God. And yet we whine and we cry because we got to. Give some. 
But here's the deal. Again, if you feel like you got to give some, don't give. Did you get it? That's why we don't pass a plate. People come in and go, you guys don't take an offering. We don't take an offering. God doesn't need your tip. He doesn't need it. I mean, I, I, I've been there. And I still remember the previous church I was at when we started this. There were people who were worried that we were going to have enough money to pay the bills. I said, well, if that's, a, if that's the problem, we don't, we don't need it anyway. We need to downsize. But you know what happened that next week? Giving went up. Giving went up. Giving is an act of worship because of what he has done for you. I don't want somebody coming in who doesn't know the Lord <laughs> reaching in their wallet and throwing God a $5 tip because the plate came best and they felt obli- obliged to put something in it. God doesn't need your money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the entire earth. He doesn't need your money. Your money is only an expression of who, how much he means to you. Do you get it? That's the deal. If God wants something to make something happen, that's why we don't charge for the books or for the shirts or whatever. And we used to do a one and now with the kids club. That's why we don't really want to charge for, for family camp. If God wants the ministry to happen, he'll provide the funds for it to happen. Does that make sense? God owns it all. And at the point where he says, okay, that ministry can be done, guess what? The resources won't be there for it. That's okay. It's going to be okay. It would be okay, wouldn't it? Why? Because God is God. And he will provide for what he wants. So freely you have received what? Freely give. It's not out of compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. And I love this. I mean, you might have heard this in the past. But that Greek word for cheerful is hilaros. Hilaros, which is where we get our word. Hilarious. Laughter. Just overwhelming cheerfulness. That it's not a matter of crying. It's a matter of laughing and rejoicing. I get to give this. How exciting. God has given me so much that I can give this. I could just picture the, the widow. I can put my two pennies in. She didn't do that. She put it all in. Because she knew the God who gave her the pennies could give her more. I think of the widow back in Elijah's day. Was it Elijah or Elisha? Where the, 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 the oil and the flour didn't run out. Until the, it was Elijah, wasn't it? It was Elijah, yeah, okay. I always get the, their stories mixed up in my brain. I mean, could you imagine what it was like for that widow that day? When this guy, I don't know whether she knew it was Elijah or not, she, this guy comes, and they're supposed to be what? Hospitable. That was their culture. That's why, remember, Lot goes down, and he takes the two angels, who he doesn't know they're angels, he just knows they're men, and says, no, no, please don't sleep there. Come, come back, back to my house. You've got to come back to my house. So she goes, she's out there, and she meets this guy, and the guy says... You got anything food? She says, well, all I really have is just, you know, I'm getting a stick so I can make a little fire, and all I have is enough to make a little bit of piece of bread, you know, so that my son and I can eat it when he can die. And then being the spiritual leader that he was, he says what? Make it for me. <laughs> okay, now this, is, this goes against the uh, agape love thing, okay? But anyways, but she was being what? Tested. She was being tested. Would she do it? Because the greatest commandment is to do what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. Okay? What's the extension of it? Love your neighbor. Love others as yourself. And so she looks at this man and realizes what? He needs food too. And so now it's a test of her or what? Her faith, her love. Make sense? Dude, were you not listening? There's only enough for me and my son. You think I'm going to give to you what should have been for my son? Ouch. 
Do we only give knowing we have what? Extra to pay our bills? As long as I can pay my bills, God, I'm good. You can get, you can get your little portion. You know, it's still a tip. It's still a tip. When you give when it hurts, that's when commitment starts to show. So she said what? Come on, and I'll make you the food. And because, again, we don't know what would have been. We only know what will be. And she made a decision at that moment, and we know what was because she made that decision. And what happened for her and her son? They had more than one meal, didn't they? They had food as long as the famine lasted. How cold is that? God loves a cheerful giver. And so that slides into the first of these promises. And that is you will be blessed. Galatians 6 tells us, Be not mocked, or, or be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that also shall he reap. If he sows unto his flesh, he shall of his flesh reap corruption. But if he sows unto his spirit, he will of his spirit reap life everlasting. It's a principle. You reap what you you reap what you sow. And so here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll come to these other verses in a moment. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, which we just read, beginning of verse 6, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. God is able to, to bless your socks off. Look at verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. So how does it play out? As you give, God what? God gives back. I'm not going to use names, but this is a really current illustration that's really, it's really neat. God placed somebody on my heart that we needed to help. We've helped in the past and that we needed to, we should help again. And so uh, we got a Kroger card. And, um, and so to, to give this to this individual. And there was a delay and um, being able for me to get up with this individual to give it to them. Um, And so the day that I was finally able to coordinate, um, before I'm able to coordinate, I get a text from the individual showing me that they've made a gift through um, the bank that they they scheduled to, uh, to send a check to the church for the exact amount that I was going to give the Kroger card. And so I was able to go and give the card, and the person then texts me back and says, no, 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 I want to be able to give to the church, not just get. And I said, you don't get it. You did. That's really cool. I said, but God already laid it on our heart. I already bought this card beforehand. And then God delayed me being able to, the, 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 for this to happen so that you would see that he is able to Provide, even when you take the step of faith, to give. Because the person didn't really have it to give. But we've been talking for, for weeks and months now. And, and, kinda, and so one of the challenges was, are you going to just trust God? Make sense? And so it was really just a, a cool moment. God can do it. Do you get it? He's not going to do it all the time. But God knows your needs. Seek ye first the what? Kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things. How many? All these things will be what? Added unto you. Do you believe what he says? Or don't you believe what he says? Somebody take Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. Somebody want to go there and read it for us? Read it real up, David. Okay, somebody go to Proverbs 19, verse 17. Who's going to take that? Proverbs 19, verse 17. Not all at once. Thank you, Jimmy. All right, and then Brian, I saw your hand, so you can take Proverbs 28, 27. Okay? So, David? Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. Honor the wealth of the Lord from the first. 
Steve, can you, Steve, can you turn the fan off while they're reading? It makes it hard for the people in the back to hear that. Okay, so Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with the, what? First fruits, right? In other words, does anybody remember what a first fruit was? Help me out. What's the first fruit? The beginning of the harvest. The beginning of the harvest. Okay, so it's the beginning of the harvest. And so you, you, you get it together. You, you take off what you're going to need for the year. And then you give God the rest. No, it's not how it happened, was it? You took the beginning of the harvest and you what? You gave it all, not knowing if tomorrow there was going to be the hailstorm that would destroy everything else, whether you were going to get anything from the rest of the crop at all. But you take the first fruits and you what? And you just give it. Now, what's really cool about this passage then, trust, you know, trusting the Lord in, in, with the first fruits, right? And then fill your barns. What's the, what's the context of this? Somebody start quoting this to me. How about beginning in verse 5? Yeah, trust in the Lord. You know this verse. Trust in the Lord in all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in what? How many ways? All your ways. And then what? He will direct your paths. Do you know what Solomon's doing in this? He's giving him an illustration Probably the hardest thing for us in how we can what? Acknowledge him. He's already given us instructions. What more does he need to do? I mean, read the word of God and you'll get the instructions. It's right there. Basic instructions before leaving the earth, right? Okay. I mean, it's there. So God tells the need for first fruits. Okay. So what should I do? I need to know the will of God in this. Why? He's already told you the will of God. He wants your first fruits. He wants you, and then he wants your gifts. Because once he's got you, guess what he got? He gives it all. It's not going to be a struggle anymore. But that's where the struggle always lies. Coming all the way back to this priority of giving thing, it's because you haven't given yourself. If you're struggling with it, it's because you think you own it. You think you're still in control. You're still sovereign over everything that you do. You're not sovereign. He is sovereign. And when you give it totally up, when it's all gone, when you lay your body down as a living sacrifice and everything's his, giving becomes easier. Because I'm really not giving of anything of mine. I'm just being a steward. And if God wants to be generous with what he's given to me, let him be generous. Because I know that ultimately these balance, these accounts are all his. And if he's going to burden me to, out of this account that he's given me to watch over, that he wants me to take this amount and put it over here. He knows that he doesn't want it in the red. God doesn't owe anybody. You track with that? God doesn't owe anybody. The borrower is servant to the lender. God doesn't owe anybody. And I honestly, 100% believe that if God has burdened your heart to give something, he will never make you be in debt for that. I don't believe in debt. You are in debt. If you're buying a house, you're ultimately in debt. But don't worry about that. If you're renting a house, you're in debt too. Okay, okay? The minute you turn on the lights, we're in debt. So there's a part of that, okay? But God knows the things that we need. That's part of Matthew chapter 6, right? He's going to provide for those things. So if God is going to make me, make me, I don't mean it that way, but, but it just encourage me to give beyond what it makes sense for me. I, one thing I know, and that is God's going to what? He's going to provide in whatever way it is. He's going to provide. The next one in Proverbs, Proverbs um, 19, verse 17. Jimmy. So he who lends to the Lord or gives to the poor, right? Ultimately, what lends it to the lends it to the Lord? You get that, okay? If you give, I, I never, I never give a loan. Never, ever, ever give a loan. I give it as a gift. 
Because if it doesn't come back to me, then there's not a problem. Make sense? Now, if, if someone gives to me, I ultimately I want to pay it back. Make sense? But sometimes there's circumstances that what? It doesn't. But you know what? If you give it to somebody, and, and you're expecting it to come back, and it doesn't come back, what happens? You get angry. You get bitter. Bitterness comes in, and relationships are destroyed. Don't do that. Ultimately, when you give, you give it to who? To the Lord. Does it make sense? It may be that somebody else is the recipient, but it doesn't matter. I'm giving it to the Lord, and the Lord knows how to what? Again, pay back the loan. Okay? Last one, Proverbs. Oh, let's go backwards. Proverbs what? Yeah, 28, verse 27. Hmm. Yeah, I I uh, I don't know whether I would have stopped for that uh those papers. I would have been scheduled. Well, look at that! All that paper went. Now, if somebody said, "Oh, they look like hundred dollar bills," I mean, I might have you know. <laughs> but that's a great testimony, Brian. Just in and of itself, that you stopped, that you were willing. To, you're more event oriented than schedule oriented, though. And so, event oriented people don't have a problem with that. Tammy's scheduling, she's probably sitting there, Brian, what are you doing? Anyways, no, I'm just picking there. <laughs> but, but Tammy's the one who what? Wanted the witness to the person. So, see, God puts teams together. I love it. Okay? Anyways, and so, but that's the whole idea is, 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 is taking this time to be able to what? To do it. And God will what? He'll always pay it back. God will always bless him back. But the more important thing, the most important thing out of all this is where we're going to come into. Look at where it says then at the very end. Um, chapter 9, verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread to the food supply and multiply the seed that you have sown. Second Corinthians 9, verse 10 have sown and increased the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for what? For all liberality. liberality. What is he saying? That God's going to enrich you, God's going to supply for you so that you can what? Be generous. So you can give liberally. Why? Which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof, this goes back to that proof thing again, the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them for all men and by their prayer for you who long for you because the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Do you know, we haven't discussed, talked about this, what was the whole purpose of this giving? I think I have it in the beginning of your sermon note sheet. Do you know what they're even giving for? This goes back to chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, um, chapter 16, verse 1. They were giving for the needs of the believers in Judea. Okay? So, let's take this a step further, because now you've got to go in the book of Acts to see this. But there was a prophet who prophesied that famine was going to come and that there was going to be this need then within the body. So based upon that, the church started taking up a collection to send to the believers of Judea. So when the famine came, the church in Judea would be taken care of. No, I'm not going to do this. But what if I came in today and I said, I believe that the church in China, because of this coronavirus, is going to need da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and God wants us to take up a million dollars to send it over to them. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You think, uh, oh, Bob's gone off the deep end. Okay? But that's sort of what's going on here. There was a prophet who prophesied and the church came alongside. 
And the collection is going on. So this collection, think about it. So the Macedonians are setting the example for the people in Achaia, who are the Corinthians, okay, the, the people of the city of Corinth. Achaia was that southern portion of Greece, okay? And so, so we don't need to have the Macedonians. You get it, uh, the Macedonians were north of them. They were more barbaric and stuff like that. And, and so the people of Achaia, there's no way that they're going to allow the, the Macedonians to be more spiritual than they are. Make sense? And so they're all getting together, and they're, they're sending off this collection to, for the believers in Judea. They haven't got a clue who it is. I got to talk to... Um, Larry Duncan, who's going to be with us April 26th, representing the Slavic Gospel Association. But he's also, if you remember at the meetings, I shared this, he's also the, the pastor who's planting the church in Louisville, where Ken Chip Chase has been serving with him for three years with the goal of then planting a church on, across the river. Um, and I get mess this up. I think that um, Larry's in Jefferson Town and... Ken is going to plant one in Jeffersonville. Anyways, whatever. Anyway, so I got to talk to, 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 because last week we voted as part of our thing that we're going to support Ken Chipchase for two years in planting a church up there. And, um, and so we talked about this two weeks ago in the, the care group about all this going on. But there is excitement going on in those churches because this little church in Augusta, Georgia, has no contact with them at all. It's going to come alongside of work without asking him to come down and prove himself. We're just going to give. For two years, we're just going to give so that he doesn't have to work as much so that he can plant the church to which God has called him. Does that make sense? I never met Ken. I've heard of his uh, grandfather, who was a church planter at West. I know Larry Duncan, and I have also met Henry Fosberg, who is over the church extension agency out there. And so... Based upon all those things, God laid on my heart that we need to come alongside this. There needs to be 10, because he had $1,750 that he needed to be made up. There's got to be 10 churches who can give $175 a month so this guy doesn't have to work. That's stupid. I mean, how dumb that churches have such closed wallets and, and make people out there working while they're trying to do the work of the Lord. Well, but it's not here. We don't have control over it. Well, we've got to have control. It's stupid. It's not my kingdom. Can I say that any more emphatically? I'm using all the Pittsburgh city ease that I can, okay? It is just, anyways, we won't use the other word that comes to my brain. Just dumb. It is not the kingdom of Bob or the kingdom of Family Bible Church. It's the kingdom of God. And we have got to be willing to liberally give to all these works that are out there. Knowing that God what? God blesses back, but God then ultimately gets the glory. And that's what's happening. How fun is that? Matthew 5.16. Does that resonate? Does that ring a bell with anybody? What's that passage about, Matthew 5.16? Amen. That's exactly right. You are like cities that are set up on a hill whose light cannot be hid so that people see the good works and they glorify your Father in heaven. That's ultimately it. The problem is we want people to notice who? Us. Another reason not to have an offering plate. It's between you and God. It's not a matter of how much you gave. I don't know. I mean, I looked last fall when we had that vote to say we we're going to try to, you know, just start putting money aside to, to pay off the mortgage. And all of a sudden, boom, the mortgage is paid off. Now, I don't know who gave. I don't know if it was somebody in here or that came from the outside. I don't know how God did that, okay? But it's an amazing thing for me when it happens. I look at it, I go, God, you are, I, I cannot comprehend what you do. I just can't comprehend it. But I want God to get the glory. And so I rejoice in the fact that, honestly, I don't count the money. But you think, I'm the pastor, I don't know, right? I haven't got a clue. I don't know. I don't know where the gifts come from. Every once in a while, I'll ask Steve, Steve, do I need to write a thank you note on behalf of the church for whatever? Just, no. Nope. And so, nope. You know, it came in anonymously. Well, it didn't come in anonymously. Steve probably knows. George, you might have known. I don't know if you were counting that day. But I don't know, and these guys haven't talked, and so I'm good with that. Make sense? It's all to God be the glory. And that's John 15, verse 8, 
Does anybody remember what that passage is about? I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth, what? Much fruit, for therein is your Father glorified. When, when we abide in Christ and Christ abides in us, then ultimately we are going to be very fruitful. Okay, and there's other, I'm kind of combining things in there, okay? Because you're going to ask what you will and it'll be given to you. But when you bring forth much fruit, therein will your Father be glorified. Again, it's all about God. There is thanksgiving given to God because, and there was. I mean, again, go back to the illustration about the, 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 the Kroger card. <laughs> There's a whole lot of rejoicing going on in the text, you know, because of what God is doing. 1 Corinthians 10.31, you all know it, right? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. What's all? All. All, including giving. Giving isn't about me. Giving ultimately is about God. And a couple years ago, I shared, it was January 1st, probably two years ago, two and a half years ago, whatever it is now, two and a quarter years ago, um, philosophy of life. The, to have the fullness of life is all about redeeming that which cannot be saved to invest in the redemption of that which can be saved by laying all that I am on the altar that he may alter all that I am. I've got to be willing to invest in people's finite lives that it's dividends in their eternal lives. Do you get it? But too many times I'm so stuck at looking at the here and now. And I forget I'm an eternal being. I was reminded of that this morning in my quiet time in Jeremiah, the end of chapter 3 and in the beginning of chapter 4. And Yahweh's talking about the new heavens and the new earth, and um, and sin sin's going to be gone. I mean, there's not going to be any the evil, wicked desires of our hearts are going to be gone. And I still get the willies when I think of eternity. As a math major, I it doesn't I can't comprehend it. It's like dividing by zero. How do you, what is it? It's undefined. How do you define eternity? The only way you, tr- you can, you try to, is defining it as a, source, as a matter of what? Time. But do you realize it's beyond time? Because in Genesis 1, 1, God created what? Time, space, and matter. He created time by making matter and putting it in space. And the minute you put matter into space, you've got time. That's the three realms I live in. <laughs> I can't. It boggles my brain. Mars says, stop thinking about it. <laughs> it's fun, but, it's, it, but when, when I go beyond it, I try to think, well, how long is it? <laughs> it just, it doesn't end. My computer just goes, you know. And I'm worried about another hundred bucks here. Another 20 bucks here. Another thousand bucks there. What is that compared to all of eternity? And so Matthew 6, it's not up there, but Jesus said, lay up for yourselves what? Treasures Treasures in heaven, where the moth and the rust doth not corrupt, rather than laying up for yourself treasures on earth. So in the end, what is the basis of your giving? Have you given yourself? You may be here today, and you're really not truly a believer. I don't know. You have intellectual assent. Maybe you know it up here, but it's not really here. I had that. 23 years. I grew up in a church. I could tell you the books of the Bible. I mean, I could tell you a whole lot of stuff, but I didn't know God. It hadn't changed my life. 
other than it messed up my Sunday mornings. I, I, I say that tongue-in-cheek. You get what I'm saying? Because I was just going out of ob- obligation. And if I gave anything, it was a what? A tip. But then Jesus came into my life, and it's changed everything. Are you a cheerful giver or a begrudging giver? Is the glory of God truly your primary motivation? Do you desire that whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, to do all to the glory of God? Finally, then, is there a need to change the way you think and ultimately change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the gift of redemption. We don't deserve it at all. Thank you for your provision in our lives, Lord. Um, We have never known need. There are many believers around the world, Lord, who, who struggle at times looking for food, and yet you still provide for them. Lord, we have so many blessings that we take for granted. Forgive us for that. Help us to be honestly, truly thankful people. To give thanks, Lord, not just with our lips, but truly from our hearts. Because you've given Jesus Christ your Son. You alone are worthy. We give you the glory in Christ's name. Amen.